Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started in just a second here. Hello to those of us who are just seeing this. We're gonna get started soon. Thanks so much for being here. All right, we're going to wait a couple more minutes, but as we wait, if you're just joining us, go ahead and put your name and where you're from in the chat, and also an issue that you want to see addressed this upcoming election cycle. Uh, as I stated, I am very, very interested in seeing Fair Maps address, which I'm glad to have Carlene here, so uh, we'll go ahead and get into that conversation pretty soon, so uh, feel free to engage in the chat. And just to go over a little ground rules, uh, if you do have a question for any of our speakers tonight, Feel free to add your question in the chat and we'll go ahead and ask uh, the guests in, in their segment their question that you want to see at, answered. Um, so, yes, it's going to be a very engaging uh, discussion. So we want to see you guys, you guys participate in this discussion. So uh, if you got questions, definitely put them in the chat and we'll save them and uh, ask the guests the question uh, when that time comes. So thank you guys for joining. Uh, it's 6.04. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, and if you guys have any questions, like I said, just put them in the chat and I'm going to hand it off to Eric. Yes, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Really, really appreciate it and super excited to get into all of the content today. Um, we're going to start with some quick announcements real quickly here because we've got some very exciting news. Um, so first of all, um, we've previously endorsed Sam Harshner for Shorewood Village Trustee, um, as well as Missy Zomber for Milwaukee School Board for the at-large seat. Please do not neglect these candidates. Sam is a prolific writer. He's a dad. He's a professor. Um, he's serious about ensuring that Shorewood uh, is an affordable, equal, and equitable community. Missy Zomber is an MPS uh, parent, and she is on the front lines of GOP's war on public education. Missy is up against a big money candidate who supports school privatization schemes and the continued attack on teachers. Missy, meanwhile, uh, is championing smaller class sizes, better nutrition for students, keeping incarceration out of the classroom, and supporting teachers with dignity, benefits, and good wages, something our MVP himself, Bernie Sanders, um, has been talking about a lot the last few days. Um, but we do have two new endorsements to announce that we just announced earlier today. We are so excited to announce Juliana Bennett um, and MGR Govindarajan from Madison Common Council. Both of these all-star young people are running in the student-dominated aldermanic districts in Madison. So MGR is a current student at UW-Madison, and Juliana is actually the incumbent alder in District 8, which she won as a student, endorsed by us two years ago, um, but due to redistricting, and we'll talk a little bit about redistricting tonight and how that uh, has to do with the Supreme Court, but due to redistricting, Juliana is running in a different district now, so she's running in District 2, even though she is um, already an alder. Um, and Juliana has an excellent track record fighting police overreach, speaking out against discrimination, and highlighting the growing cost of living crisis in Madison and Wisconsin and in our nation. Um, she does unfortunately have two opponents, meaning she has a primary election next week. So at the end of the meeting, we'll talk about how you can help elect Juliana and flip the Supreme Court at the same time, because we like to be efficient here. Um, but speaking of the court, let's get to the main attraction tonight. So I'm going to give some overview right now. Tonight's organized to win meeting is centered around the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about, maybe seen some ads about too lately. The New York Times and Politico both called this the most important race of 2023. It's really not hard to see why. Uh, to give some very basic context, Wisconsin has a Supreme Court just like our federal Supreme Court, um, and it has many of the same powers. Unlike the Supreme Court of the United States, justices in Wisconsin are not appointed, but rather are elected directly by the voters in a nonpartisan election. So the Wisconsin Supreme Court um, has seven seats in staggered 10-year terms, 
uh, conservative Justice Rogensack is retiring and four candidates are running to serve in that 10 year term, in the next 10 year term. Um, so former uh, conservative Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Dan Kelly is giving it another try after losing by over 10 points to Justice Jill Kowalski in 2020. Um, but retiring Justice Rogensack instead endorsed Jennifer Darrow, a right wing judge who became famous for overseeing the trial of Walker Shop parade attack defendant Daryl Brooks. Um, Dan Kelly is a Scott Walker era right wing judge who is shameless about supporting gerrymandering, abortion restrictions and big business over the rights of workers. Jennifer Darrow, meanwhile, while vague about many of her beliefs, is radical in her anti-choice stance um, and is endorsed by dozens of right-wing sheriffs and police unions and judges. Um, just today, the Susan B. Anthony Super PAC, it's an anti-choice group, announced its support for Dan Kelly because of his anti-choice views. So this means there are two radical right-wing big money candidates in this race. However, there are also two left of center candidates running for Supreme Court as well. That's Janet Prosevitz. Um, and Everett Mitchell, and they have both been extremely clear about their rightful disgust with rigged maps, attacks on voting rights, and Wisconsin's criminal 1849 abortion ban. This is crucial because, as many of you know, Wisconsin is gerrymandered. Even though they win roughly half of statewide votes, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, um, Republicans have almost two-thirds control of both the Assembly and the State Senate. So that means a fair, independent, pro-democracy court will be central to defend the rights of Wisconsinites and roll back conservative attacks on our democracy. Uh, the amount of money flowing into this race is already crazy. And here at our Wisconsin Revolution, we have a little saying, we like to follow the money because who candidates raise their money from says everything about how they will use their position, which is why we include that figure at the end here as well. Um, the last big thing to know is that since this is a nonpartisan race, two conservatives or two progressives theoretically could both make it through the primary. Um, meaning your vote really does count right now, maybe more than it ever has, or at least more than it has for a very long time. So for that reason, and a few others, our Wisconsin Revolution is not endorsing this primary, but we are organizing to stop Doro uh, or Kelly from winning a 10-year term um, and highlighting all of the issues that are at stake, as you can see some of those on the screen. And that is a tremendous segue into our fabulous guest speaking of what is at stake. So Andre, would you be able to take it from here? Yeah, thank you, Eric, and thank you for that amazing breakdown and what's at stake for this election. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into what we all come to see, and that's our guest speaker. So our first guest is Carlene Beckin. Uh, she is a retired educator who became involved in the movement to end gerrymandering after testifying before the Joint Finance Committee in support of public education for several biennial I always have a hard time with that one, uh, budget cycles and realizing that her words were falling on deaf ears. Legislators are un unaccountable to their constituents, and it's clear that they are not listening on issues ranging from public education and Medicare and Medicare expansion to gun violence prevention and legalization of cannabis. Carlene has been engaged in grassroots activism since she was a child canvassing with her dad in Southeast North Carolina community. She is a founding member of the Oregon Area Progressives which organized the Fair Match for Wisconsin Summit for Grassroots Activists in the fall of 2019. From that work, Carlene was hired as organizing director for, for director with the Wisconsin Fair Match Coalition. Thank you for joining us, Carlene. I'm really excited that you can come and speak with us about this Supreme Court race. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I just realized I was muted still. Uh, no um, worries, it's, it's classic Zoom situation. Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well. It's Valentine's Day and there's a lot to love about uh, a lot of things. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. Thanks. How about you? I'm doing amazing. I'm really ecstatic about this upcoming election. I think there's a lot of opportunities that we can really start to hammer at uh, when it comes to policy issues. So thanks for asking. But yeah, let's go ahead and get right into these questions. Um, obviously, Fair Maps is the thing that you're an expertise of. So we'll go ahead and get right into that. So of the competing redistricting plans, John Johnson from Marquette University found that in a statewide tie, Republicans would be expected to win 63 of 99 assembly seats and 23 of 33 Senate seats under the new GOP map, creating one of the worst partisan gerrymanders in the United States history. In a state that is considered a 50-50, this brings into question whether Wisconsin is a true democracy. Despite Democratic Governor Tony Evers uh, winning re-election by about 90,000 votes, Republicans came within two assembly seats of a supermajority and won a supermajority in the Senate. 
which has since been lost due to the retirement of the um, eighth eighth uh, Senate district um, representative or senator. It is clear that gerrymandering is on the ballot this election. What would fair maps in Wisconsin look like, and how would that how would that change our day to day lives? Well, I'm going to back up just a little bit and say we've never had a true democracy in Wisconsin, and we've actually never had a true democracy in this country. So we just need to acknowledge that right from the start, there have always been people who have been disenfranchised and our, our country was built on the backs of enslaved people. So democracy has never been what we had, but that doesn't mean that we can't get better at it and that we can't uh, continually strive to be a democracy. Um, so no, we've never had a democracy here and it's in worse shape now than it's been in quite some time. Um, in the up until 2020, when the previous eight elections were um, were eight statewide elections were averaged in this state. So, uh, you know, governor's races, presidential races, Senate races, those kinds of things. The the vote breakdown was 50.5 percent voted for Democrats, 49.5 percent voted for Republicans. And so the, the, the maps are incredibly out of whack. Um, Democrats and Republicans can be blamed for that. Democrats had the opportunity in 2009 to create a nonpartisan redistricting process. They took a pass. They looked at the 2008 maps, which were very blue in Wisconsin when Obama won, and they thought they'd be the people drawing the maps in 2010. And they weren't, clearly. Uh, the, the Republicans won narrowly, all three, the trifecta, the Assembly, the Senate, and the governor's uh, seat. And Project Red Map rushed right in and made the maps that we had in 2011. Um, in 2021, they were made even worse. And so now we are looking at the issues that you named in my introduction. I was a public school teacher. I, I was, I suffered under personally under Act 10, as did my classroom and, and students in public education across the state. So what does that look like? Well, we don't have funding for public education. We have an 1849 uh, abortion ban, which I'm, I'm sure Allison is going to talk about. That is, is we, we don't have any legislation on that. Medicaid expansion didn't happen, even though 80 plus percent of Wisconsin residents wanted it because we have unaccountable legislators. So what we're looking at in this, uh, this upcoming election is the possibility, very real possibility, that a progressive justice will be elected who will follow the law. The maps that we have now are based on a, an approach, not a law, not the Constitution, that the Supreme Court decided to use, the least changes approach. That was something that was passed by a joint session of the legislature along party lines. Mm -hmm. At the time, they said, don't worry, you know, this is just a suggestion. It's not a law. It's not a law because the governor didn't sign it. The governor signs laws, vetoes bills. This was neither. It was a joint resolution. And our state Supreme Court, number one, decided to be the court of original jurisdiction, which meant that the maps didn't go through any series of courts with findings or anything. And number two, they decided to use least changes, which meant changing the already gerrymandered maps the least possible. And then the back and forth between them and the Supreme Court, they ended up choosing the most gerrymandered maps. Um, I'm glad you, you mentioned in the question the Senate district because uh, in um, Alberta Darling, after the election, decided to retire. She was not up for election this time. It was not her Senate cycle. And um, that seat has a primary among three Republicans, and there is a uh, Democratic challenger. So it is possible that perhaps there won't be a supermajority in the Senate. There is not one in the uh, assembly. However, that means that every Democrat has to be on their toes because if the governor vetoes something, the assembly can call into session 
like that and vote on oh, and vote on some on overturning a veto and if if democrats aren't paying attention and they're not around and they can't get there it could be that vetoes could be overturned by um, a, a, an assembly that is not in the supermajority. So um, this election is super crucial in order for these maps to be relitigated. And there was a second part of that question, and I don't know if you want to ask it now that you didn't ask before, or I should just answer it. <laughs> Yeah, about the possible implementation of fair right. Exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious about that because there's been a lot of talk about like if the Supreme Court changes, you know, it can actually change the Supreme Court, uh, or not the Supreme Court, but the legislative maps. But what would that process look like, and what would the timeline look like if that were the case? Well, if if there is. Um a justice who is elected, who is, and I have to say this in a very nonpartisan way, um, who is uh, more amenable to following the law and the state constitution, there are constitutional challenges that will be brought to the maps. Um, and that, that that's broader. There's already been some challenges brought to the maps uh, based on Voting Rights Act uh, violations, and they didn't go anywhere. But there are um, there's reason to believe that there are state constitutional challenges that could be brought and these maps thrown out completely and new maps, um, new maps implemented. Now, that said, a new justice is not seated until August, so that wouldn't happen until at least August. The process takes some time. There are lots of maps that have been drawn. Believe you me, there are lots of maps that have been drawn. And I would guess, this is a guess. I am not a lawyer and I don't work for Law Forward, which is where I, I could see this uh, originating. I would guess though, that once this election is done, that process of creating maps that could possibly be implemented will, will begin to take place. Um, so that there are options that can be presented. I don't know that. As I said, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I could see that being the case. And in, in because they need to be in place by next April 15th, when people need uh, the anyone who is running for uh, the state assembly, half of the state senate, for uh, Congress. And let's see, is Tammy up next? Yeah, Tammy would be up too. Anybody who wants to run for Senate and challenge her, I know she's going to run again. Um, they would have they would have to know that. Of course, she, that's a statewide race. Senate's a statewide race, so there will, districts wouldn't affect that. But by April fifteenth, they'd need to be in place. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that clarification because I haven't had anyone really break that down. It's more like oh, this could happen and, you know, that's it. So I appreciate that clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so currently 56 of the 72 Wisconsin counties have passed resolutions and referendums urging the legislator to outlaw gerrymandering. As we know from our successful Dunn County referendum, Wisconsin has non-binding referendum, meaning they merely serve as suggestions to elected officials rather than becoming the law. How can citizens get involved in these issues if their elected reps can simply ignore the will of voters? Well, um, there are lots of, yeah, it is frustrating, absolutely frustrating that we do not have a ballot initiative. And, uh, you know, we've seen it work very successfully in the state of Michigan, where they were able to get a, a nonpartisan process put in place through a ballot initiative. So what we can do is rattle cages a lot. Um, and uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, I was I was hired initially uh, as the grassroots organizing director because the little like 12 person grassroots organization that I'm part of here in the village of Oregon uh, in Southern Dane County, we, uh, we organized a summit in the middle of the state in 2019 and had 180 people come to that summit because we were tired of people saying, call your legislator because calling our legislators wasn't enough. So we we decided to do all kinds of action workshops. And Eric, if you can let me share my screen. I have uh, 
some things here that can show you what what we are doing. First of all, the the Fair Maps Coalition is nonpartisan uh, because, believe it or not, there are people all across the political spectrum who want something different, want something that is fairer to all the people of our state. So, oh, this is my acknowledgement of Black History Month and the need that to not just acknowledge Black History in Black History Month, but to work for a non-racist, anti-racist uh, society. Also, the acknowledgement of we don't live in a democracy. Um, so there are lots of things that can be done. This is a post today uh, that was put out by Law Forward about five things you can do for your loved ones. And, and um, I encourage you to, uh, I'm gonna put this, this link in the chat afterwards so that you can, uh, so folks can share it can vote early and take your friends to vote. Talk to your friends. You are the most credible voice with your friends about voting. Early voting has already started. I'm wearing my vote early shirt. See there, vote early. Um, and just note, if you have an absentee ballot, you need to get it in right away because there's no postal service on Monday because it's President's Day. So get your absentee ballot in like tomorrow would be the last day I would mail it. And if I had an absentee ballot that I hadn't mailed by tomorrow, I'd take it in on election day and give it to the clerk. And you can vote on election day, of course. That's always, uh, that's always uh, advisable. Um, our goal is to, I'm gonna skip through these, know who the candidates are. Um, these are the interviews from uh, public radio, uh, public television, the Here and Now program with each of the candidates and links to their websites. I'll send all of this to Andre and he can send it on to whomever wants to. These are all live links. Know what the Supreme Court does. This is super, super important. Badger State Research did research um, of voters around the state and found that a lot of people, number one, didn't know there was an election. That's a really important thing of getting the word out about the election. But number two, they really didn't know what the Supreme Court did, does. So they think, you know, that they're hearing criminal cases. They're not. You know, they, they hear all kinds of other cases. And this report really uh, highlights the anti-democracy rulings of the last session and some of the big cases related to maps, voting rights, abortion, environmental issues that are very likely to come up in the next session. Um, it's easy reading and it, um, it's, it really helps to understand. So it's a must read. So knowing things is really important so you can talk intelligently. This is a really fun, simple, I call it a party game because this is I live this, breathe this, uh, that uh, was created by a group of volunteers over in Iowa County. It's a Google quiz. And, you know, I mean, have friends over, get them ready for the election. Talk about it um, and uh, see how accurate you, you could be. I'm in this work and I got eight out of 10. So uh, my, my incorrect answers were the not percentage answers. We are mailing postcards to voters. Uh, we did 5,000 pre-primary. I ordered today 10,000. If you're interested in sending postcards, um, let us know. There's a, again, there's a, a link for this. Uh, we have handouts and bookmarks that you can download and print and hand out. And um, back to that very beginning with the Law Forward Valentine's video, we have a social, a, a grassroots social media amplification um, group. We have about almost 60 people in this now who share on their own social media platforms, but then they also share to the groups that they're part of. So I'm part of the OWR Dane County group. I share posts on there all the time and as do the other social media amplifiers and, and it's a really simple system. I send the link to them in in uh, messenger i have a group that's fairmaps coalition social media amplification group 
they send it on and it 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 boosts our um, algorithm so that people are seeing things and learning accurate information because there is so much bs out there in that is intentionally misleading that we have to counter with our message we do not help ourselves when we say can you believe he said because we just say it again and that is bad 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 just like we don't want to say their names and the people that we don't want elected to the Supreme Court, we want to say all good things about all the people that we want and not say their names. And then uh, we want to get Spindell off of the Wisconsin Election Commission, especially, I mean, we knew he was bad. We knew he was bad. He was a fake elector. We knew that was bad. But then the email that he sent to Milwaukee County Republicans about it, it being able to successfully suppress the vote of black and brown voters. Are you kidding? Really? And he's still on the Wisconsin Election uh, Commission. Actually, they don't meet tomorrow anymore. That was this is an old slide. Um, and then letters to the editor. Again, you are credible in your community. These are these are sample letters that can be adapted and we encourage people to send them. Um, and this will be important all the way through the, uh, the April 4th election. And these change depending on what's the, the most pertinent um, topic. And just a reminder, this is one of my very favorite uh, quotes. The importance of doing activist work is precisely because it allows you to give back and to consider yourself not as a single individual, but to be a part of an ongoing historical movement. We are continually trying to create the democracy in which we want to live. We don't have it yet. It's an ongoing movement and someday we'll get there. Maybe not in my lifetime, but hey, I have granddaughters. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all that education. Um, even to this day, when I'm having conversations with people around Sheboygan, they have no idea that our district was split in half. They still think it's Sheboygan is one district. And that's yep. 10 years after the maps have been rigged. So wow. education about this issue is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sharing it with friends and family is amazing. And to go to your point there about, you know, kind of political nihilism a little bit, um, I always say the only time you lose is when you stop fighting. And that's what we have to continue Absolutely. to do. We have to continue fighting. And then as long as we continue doing that, there's no way we'll lose. So I appreciate it, uh, Carlene. Is there any other information that you want to share about uh, how people get involved, or maybe they want to contact you. Uh, or... um, yeah, absolutely. I will put several links in here, the the bookmark, the postcard, uh, how to be a social media amplifier, the letter to Lamehu, and my uh, email address. I'll just drop all of those one at a time into the into the chat. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk. I mean, I can talk all day about this, but you don't you don't really want to hear my voice for that. Trust long. me, I do, but I'm sure we have to respect everyone's <laughs> time. So I appreciate it, Carly. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Will Walter, and uh, he's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Andre. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm William. I am policy research with OWR, and I am very, very excited to be uh, introducing Allison Chavez Stewart. Allison is the bilingual director of community relations for Planned Parenthood Advocates of Wisconsin and Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. She is working to build the agency's community centric model, which centers patients and communities' needs and seeks to build resources and partnerships around each Planned Parenthood health center to work in collaboration with the community to improve health equity and outcomes. Prior to working at Planned Parenthood, she had a 20 year career in community engagement in the arts, most recently at Milwaukee Ballet. Uh, and in both of those roles, she has tried to break down barriers and stigma surrounding those industries, being, of course, healthcare and the arts, that can make people feel excluded. Allison believes that healthcare and health and wellness in general is a right, and much like the arts, should be accessible to everyone. Good experiences in both can be transformative and life-saving. Allison, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. Doing great. Thanks so much for having me. So our first question for you, Allison, is... Abortion, as we mentioned with uh, Fair Maps, obviously will be on the ballot as well for the upcoming Supreme Court race. Uh, as the Wisconsin Supreme Court is expected to hear challenges to the 1849 law that makes it a felony to perform an abortion at any stage of pregnancy unless done to save the life of the pregnant individual. 
Uh, providers across the state have completely stopped performing abortions following the U.S. Supreme Court's overturning of Dobbs v. Jackson. And while the Attorney General Josh Call is currently suing to block that law in a case almost certain to reach the state's highest court, uh, as of right now, it has not. What impact would a progressive justice have towards protecting women's health? How quickly could this case proceed? And how long would Wisconsinites suffer if we are unable to win this election? Um, yeah, so I'm here tonight representing Planned Parenthood advocates of Wisconsin. Like Carlene said, we have to be very careful to be um, nonpartisan in our comments. Um, so let me give you all a quick little recap. Um, when the Dobbs decision came down on June 24th, um, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin and the rest of the abortion providers in the state stopped performing abortions, um, literally with patients in the waiting rooms who may not have even known anything about the Supreme Court's impending decision. Um, not everybody is following the news and following the issues like those of us are here, and that is perfectly fine. And it is, you know, things like this that can really help to educate people about what's going on. But because there's an 1849 law, as we keep um, saying on the books in Wisconsin, that deems abortion a criminal act with no exceptions for rape, incest, or the health of the pregnant person. So because there has not been legal clarity provided um, regarding the enforcement of this law, again, I'm just gonna keep saying from 1849 because I think it's important to remind people what we're dealing with in the year 2023. Um, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin did not want its providers or support staff to be at risk of being criminally charged. Um, all attempts to repeal this law within the legislature have been, been, have been blocked. And in fact, just days before the Dobbs decision, I think two days before it was, Republicans gaveled in and out of the issue without debate in about 12 seconds, and just recently denied the opportunity to put an advisory referendum on the ballot, asking voters whether they think the 1849 ban should be repealed. So when the decision came down, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin began working with Planned Parenthood of Illinois to support the influx of patients who would need to leave their own state to seek health care. As an example, Planned Parenthood of Illinois saw 72 patients from Wisconsin in June of 2022 and saw 280 from Wisconsin in July. So um, their numbers in, uh, increased immediately. Many staff members are traveling to Illinois once or twice a week to provide care. Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin will still see patients before a procedure to confirm pregnancy and gestational age, to help patients na um, navigate to the correct type of appointment in Illinois or any of the other states where abortion is still legal. And we, and excuse me, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin will be there for them when they return to Wisconsin. Uh, nobody was laid off, no health centers were closed and all the rest of Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin's family planning services are still available at 22 health centers across the state. That's just a little background information. Um, so in terms of access in Wisconsin, there are two paths, um, legislative and legal. Um, legislative would be if the state legislature could repeal 94004, which is the official name of that law, which would restore access. They could take it a step further and even pass a law codifying the right to an abortion. These acts would allow abortion services to resume in Wisconsin, but this is unlikely to happen given the makeup of the state legislature and unlikely to happen as long as we are as gerrymandered as we are. Legally, any challenges to the criminal abortion ban or any subsequent abortion laws will make their way most likely to the Supreme Court. In matters of state law and state constitution, the Wisconsin Supreme Court will have the final say. And while we don't know how a, any particular candidate will rule in a particular case, we do know that the uh, judicial conservative candidates are backed by anti-abortion groups and that they agree with the Dobbs decision and do not favor reproductive rights. Their values and judicial philosophies show us the lens from which they'll review facts and decide cases. So um, as you said, the case is currently make, making its way through the court system. Um, there was a motion to dismiss it about a month ago, but um, Attorney General Josh Call and Tony Evers are persisting. And as Call said, they are continuing our fight to obtain a definitive ruling that Wisconsin's 19th century abortion ban with no exceptions for rape or incest has not gone back into effect. Um, so like Carlene said, um, we just, uh, or like she mentioned, um, 
new justices, the new slate won't start until um, August. So that could be the soonest if the case makes it to the Wisconsin Supreme Court that a ruling could happen. But it, you know, we don't know. We don't have a timeline and we're not informed of any decisions um, until they happen. So as everyone, not just here, but in the country is mentioning, this race is definitely one of the most important in the country. Um, ben Wickler, the chair of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin, has called this race Wisconsin's version of the Kansas City referendum, as it does provide voters with an opportunity to express issues they support via the candidates they select. We know that abortion is supported anywhere from 60 to 80 percent in Wisconsin, but unfortunately, our laws and leg legislature are not reflecting that support. So if this case were to go in front of a progressive-led state Supreme Court, the outcomes could really change um, for Wisconsinites. We can't predict what will happen, how folks will vote, nor when everything will happen. We just have to do a lot of waiting right now and continue to um, advocate and raise the issues, educate people. Everything Carlene just shared is so, so important um, about talking to people, um, that there's even a race happening and what the issues really are and why it's so important that they get out there. So that's kind of where we're at right at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Allison. Do we have any questions from the audience that would like clarification on anything or any more specific uh, uh, questions that you may have? Okay, seeing none. Allison, uh, I'd like to just open the floor to you then. Um, so obviously this race will dictate the future of, of women's health in the state of Wisconsin. Um, as well as fair maps, as we covered pretty extensively. And this is a 10 year term, so this will be going into the next decade. How can we as individuals, you know, we asked Carlene this question, but I think this is incredibly important to ask all organizers what their thoughts are. How could we get involved with your organization or how could we impact uh, this at the ground level and where can we reach you going forward? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is that it's not just women's health. Um, abortion is healthcare, period, and it's an, an issue that affects um, everybody, whether they really want to think about that or not. Um, I think in terms of this race, there's no doubt it's exhausting to be in this sort of never-ending cycle of like unprecedented times and the most important election of our lifetimes and all of that, but I think um, like we're talking about right now, as we all become more aware of how polarized the country is and how extreme the laws and the proposed laws are um, are becoming regarding abortion, public health, voting rights, LGBT issues, um, it's everything that's happening right now um, for trans people in this country, all the attacks against them, issues in schools, gun safety, all of that. We just have to accept that if we want things to change, we have to be part of the change. So we can't afford to take an election off or tune out. We can't get lazy and we have to continue to talk about these issues to our friends and family, our coworkers, our neighbors, and we have to take advantage of the privilege that we all have to vote. People have died for us to have this right and so we can't ignore it or get complacent. <clears throat> this particular race, as we all know, is gonna get more intense after the primary. It will be, it already really is a national focus. Um, it's being, I'm sure you're all hearing it, um, it's being mentioned in the New York Times and Politico on Pod Save America, um, and people are sort of saying this is the most important le election that maybe nobody's heard of. Um, so we just have to keep talking about it and educating people about what's um, at stake. So we should be asking um, people if these issues are important to them and if they concern you know, they really do concern all of us. Um, and if if these important if these issues are interesting to you, then you should get um, educated and learn about what's happening. So we can't tell people who to vote for. Obviously, right now, um, Planned Parenthood advocates of Wisconsin won't be endorsing until after the primary. Um, but we encourage, just like Carlene said, for people to get to know the candidates and really see what they stand for and what their values are, because that's going to show us how they're gonna vote on these important issues. Um, in terms of the issue that I'm representing today, um, I will say this, that abortion is healthcare. Someone that you know and love has either had an abortion or may need one in the future, and what then? So it might be an uncomfortable topic for some people or for the people that you're talking to, and that's okay. 
Regardless of how people feel about abortion, most of us do believe that our family and friends should have access to and be able to receive the health care they need. This intensely personal decision about whether or not to continue a pregnancy should remain with the pregnant person, their loved ones, their doctor, their higher power, but it should not include the government butting its way into the doctor's office or into somebody's body. I think that when thinking about how to engage people in this race, the answer is we really do need everyone. We'd ask that you be an ambassador for this issue. It is really not just a women's issue. It's a trans issue. It's a men's issue. It's a human issue and it affects all of us. Um, sexual and reproductive health shouldn't be relegated to an awkward taboo little silo. It's really connected to everything that we do. So if we follow the tenets of reproductive justice, which I'd encourage people to really learn about, um, <clears throat> it states that we must all have bodily autonomy and that we can decide whether to have a child or not and to have those children in safe and sustainable environments then we can see that this issue is connected to everything. So schools, the economy, the environment, jobs, housing, food security, safety, et cetera. We must continue to work towards solutions to improve health equity and health outcomes for everyone in the state of Wisconsin. And as Maya Angelou said, the truth is none of us can be free until everybody's free. This race gives people opportunities to talk about this issue on a really personal level. And that's um, really important. And people may feel like having conversations isn't doing enough. Um, a lot of people, especially right after Dobbs came down, were calling us and saying, can we, you know, drive people to Illinois? Can we, what can we do that feels hands-on? But really talking to people, um, having conversations and just destigmatizing the word abortion is a huge lift that we all need to be a part of. Um, abortion's not a bad word, it's healthcare. I'm just gonna keep saying it. Um, <clears throat> all these issues are on the line uh, in our state, whether it's the 1849 law or the myriad laws that other extreme states are creating and then just getting copycatted around the country where, you know, we're just seeing that, you know, Texas will make a law and then 10 other states will copy it. And that's sort of the pattern that's happening right now, especially with reproductive health care. So it is exhausting, but we just have to keep fighting and talking and learning and working toward making the state that making this the state we want to live in. Um, and we have to do the work passionately and compassionately, and, and we just can't give up. So I think that's my my message today. It's one day at a time, right? Rome wasn't built in a day, and it's going to take all of us. We all have a part to play. This is not going to be, you know, some random Joe walks into the state capitol and says, I believe that abortion is health care, and, you know, all the legislators are going to stand up and start clapping. Like, it's not a Disney movie. You're going to have to build connections in your neighborhood with your friends, your family. You have to talk about these issues. You have to recognize that it's uncomfortable to talk about these issues. But if you want to grow as an individual and if you want to grow as a community and as a society, you have to recognize that these are real issues that real people are facing. We can either face them or we can bury our heads in the sand and then everybody suffers. Absolutely. Love that. I'm glad you're recording this because I love what you just said. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us, Allison. That was absolutely wonderful and very, uh, so much information that we were able to get. Um, everybody, if you're interested in, in following Allison, where could we find you uh, or, you know, social media websites? Give me a few links here that I can throw in the chat. Absolutely. If people want to get involved, we have action groups and activities happening all across the state. So I'll drop that uh, link in the chat. Um, there are people, uh, our advocates are doing postcard parties and lots and lots of work on campuses across the state. But as we get closer to the election, um, canvassing, talking to people, really our approach is all about having conversations with people and just trying to find some common ground in terms of what are our values and what kind of state do we want to live in? And, you know, when you really think about the fact that when people call us right now, lots of people don't know what the laws are. And so they call us to receive health care when they're told that they they may have to go to Illinois or somewhere else. That's a, a really devastating moment for people. Um, it's not how health care should be. And so this these are the kinds of things that we want people to know about so that um, we can make changes. Um, we really do have to get people out for this election. Um, it's It's really, really important. And it was mentioned earlier, um, and you kind of touched on it too, Allison, that you as an individual are the most 
reliable source to your friends, your family, and your neighbors, right? They are getting inundated with propaganda left and right from every avenue they possibly can, every social media platform, every media apparatus in the country is blasting them with information. But if they hear from you, from their son, their daughter, their mother, their father, their, their best friend, their cousin, somebody that they inherently trust and believe is a good person, supports X idea, well, you know, I also think I'm a good person. And if my friend Allison, who I find to be a good person, thinks this is good, why would I not also support that? So it's so it's so vital to be able to build those connections. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Allison. I'm going to throw it back to Andre for the next section. Andre, please take it away. Yeah, thanks. We we'll appreciate that segment. That was great and very informative. So our next, uh, our last speaker, last but not least, is uh, Alan Robinson. He is the co-founder of Herbal Aspects. Thanks for joining us, Alan. How are you doing today, man? I'm well. Uh, you know, Andre, I, I have to first offer my apologies for being late to this uh, gathering. Um, <clears throat> I had a meeting run late and then I was having a conversation with Senator Agard just prior to this. And so um, you'll forgive hey, me. No, no worries. Hey, late, but not, not, you're still here. So that everything. Well, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try to bring some good information to the table. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So yeah, let's just go ahead and dive into it. So cannabis legalization, according to Senator Melissa Agard, projects about $165 million per year in revenue for the state of Wisconsin, a potentially conservative estimate considering the $1.5 billion in sales in Illinois during the past fiscal year, in part due to Wisconsin customers as well. I know Wisconsin people are going down there and buying them a little legal weed every once in a while. But legalization of cannabis is a fiscally sound choice, yet the decision faces numer numerous hurdles from our state legislator. Could you elaborate on why our elected officials are so against a policy that is supported by nearly 70% of Wisconsin voters? And what can we do to generate interest from our fellow voters? Yeah, sure. Uh, the bottom line is our legislature is uh, isn't it actually isn't as divided as uh, uh, the public policy stances uh, might suggest. Um, the fact is, you know, there's a lot of Republicans and Democrats who see the value of legalizing cannabis in Wisconsin. Unfortunately, the leadership of the uh, Republican caucus isn't, uh, you know, they're not necessarily for it. Uh, it when it comes down to uh, the why, you know, uh, I would like to hearken back to all of the reasons that cannabis prohibition was instituted in the first place, you know, from uh, the original prohibition for, you know, uh, uh, discriminatory reasons against black and brown people. But the reality of today's political landscape is that, you know, uh, the, the two sides are so entrenched that one side does not want to give the other side a, a massively popular political win. Uh, and, and that's what cannabis is. Cannabis is, it enjoys support from both Republicans and Democrats. And, it, you know, that's not unusual in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsinites, you know, we, we are pragmatic thinkers. Um, and so, you know, while we may agree across, quote, party lines with our fellow Wisconsinites, it is our leaders who... Uh, enjoy their seats of power, so to speak, and uh, want to maintain that those positions of authority. And so in some cases, they don't adhere to, to the tenets of their office and don't listen to the voice of the people. Uh, that's primarily why, uh, long story short, man, uh, political infighting, that's why we don't have, you know, cannabis reform in Wisconsin. Uh, I, I would love to blame it on the Tavern League. I would love to call them the boogeyman. It's just not reality, though. You know, big cannabis and big alcohol 
are lovers and they are ready to get in bed together, right? Because of the distribution networks and just the way that those industry works, they are kindred spirits, right? Uh, the Tavern League isn't, isn't the boogeyman, right? Uh, what you want in Wisconsin is a concerted effort to change the balance on the Supreme Court in Wisconsin. Uh, or else you're not going to see any movement on anything. Anything? Anything. Right? Because if you don't have maps that aren't gerrymandered, then you're not going to get representation that is, you know, actually representative of the people. Without that, then you're not going to get legislation presented to the governor that reflects the will of the people. So it's imperative that we uh, focus our efforts on this upcoming election and we put one foot before the other, that we crawl before we walk and or run to cannabis legalization. On the path to cannabis legalization, you will find uh, things like policing reform, access to uh, uh, health care, uh, access to sexual reproductive health care. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, as, as a uh, a person that identifies with the he, him, uh, I don't personally have to reproduce humans. Uh, and the only time that I ever have to think about that is when I'm thinking about going to get a vasectomy, which I think all guys should do. But uh, if we're not going to have like health care access in Wisconsin, that said, uh, I stumble over those words because I smoke a lot of weed and don't have to deal with those issues, not because I'm a toxic male big smile yeah for sure and i appreciate <laughs> you that you, you pointed out that they don't want to give the other side a political win and it blows my mind that we have a system that puts politics over the will of the people that is exactly opposite of how our system should work but instead it works in the exact opposite way that is counterproductive to uh progressive society so i appreciate you pointing out that uh very important point um, but this issue is deeper than the financial ramifications. I know that's kind of what I started with, but it also would directly reduce the over-reliance on an unjust criminal justice system and a desperate need for reform. Uh, Senator Agard also notes that studies have found no connection between legalization and crime increases, while Black people are four times more likely to be charged with a cannabis offense compared to white people, despite our usage rates being very similar. How could the legalization of cannabis change how we approach criminal justice in the state of Wisconsin? The ACLU notes that Black people are more likely to be arrested for a cannabis crime than uh, their white counterparts four times uh, more uh, nationwide. That number actually balloons to six times more uh, here in Wisconsin. So I've got a bone to pick with Senator Agar regarding that. Uh, how could uh, policing reform be affected by cannabis reform? Is that is, was that the question, Andre? Yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah the, the, the direct question was, um, how could the legalization of cannabis change how we approach criminal justice in the state of Wisconsin? Yeah. You know, um, cannabis uh, prohibition is a fundamental tenant of uh, reallocating human capital from our urban communities to our rural, rural communities by way of the prison industrial complex. Uh, according to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, um, in 2019, we arrested more than 660,000 people nationwide for a cannabis related offense uh and in uh you know at, 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 i i give you that number as opposed to the number of people that were arrested for a violent crime in 2019 which is like 500,000 so we're talking about 30% more people arrested for a nonviolent cannabis offense right nationwide um 
and because we know that you know uh, policing here in Wisconsin uh, is a little bit more stringent than that uh, the numbers from the ACLU tell us that it's worse here in Wisconsin for black people uh, the primary way that you're the first thing that you're going to see is a decrease in our prison populations right uh, you're also going to see uh, a decrease in the amount of over policing and harassment of African Americans and brown people in Wisconsin, right? Uh, Senator Agard will tell you that the most dangerous thing about cannabis in Wisconsin is that it is illegal. Uh, it is incredibly dangerous if you are a black person in Wisconsin, if the police smell weed. What's funny about that is that cannabis smells like cannabis. And there's illegal cannabis, and there's legal cannabis. So imagine a person pulling you over with some milk and saying, it smells like illegal milk. Get a car, show me your hands and all of the nine. Where'd you get this milk? You know, I sell botanical cannabis flower that has a psychoactive effect at one of my shop, both of my shops, actually. Uh, I always give my customers a receipt. The cops could pull them over and give them a good hassle regardless, right? And the police do not have to accept an, a, a viable, innocuous answer uh, to what they suspect to be a crime. So what we know is that police use the smell of cannabis or, or, or the idea that cannabis pro, uh, some cannabis law has been broken as an end road to, quote, investigate further as if they're solving a crime, right? Um, what they're really doing is they're searching for a reason to reallocate human capital from the inner city to our rural communities. And what we need to do as a community is to uh, develop an economy that partners with our rural sectors by way of their farm system and our desire for cannabis. That's going to infuse their economies with some with with the much needed resources that they need, but it isn't going to rob our communities of the human resources that we need. So, yeah, agreed. I think we definitely need to stop having this like rural urban divide and start partnering together and like really pushing this because it's important. Some of your senators, uh, Senator Taylor, Senator Agard, Senator uh, Patrick Taston over on the Republican side, folks that are working toward doing things like that. Yeah, sure. Well, that was my last question for you. So uh, really appreciate you coming on, Alan. Is there a way people can learn more about Herbal Aspect or come to your shop? Uh, and can you tell us like where they can find you? Yeah, man, you can check us out. 3547 University Avenue here in Madison. Um, we're at 2017 Winnebago Street uh, over on the east side of Madison. Uh, if you're in Madison again, you can hit us up at local.herbalaspect.com uh, and you'll get delivery powered by DoorDash or you could just go to herbalaspect.com and I will send the goodies to your house. We've got all kind of gummies. I've got the hemp derived Delta 9, 15 milligram at a fraction of the price that you're going to pay in Illinois. I've got a THCA botanical flower. Um, I've got chocolates, vapes. You know, we've got all the uh, we've got all the ways all the that you can consume cannabis uh, under one roof and all that. Besides, you know, we will help to guide you through your cannabis experience if you are not uh, well versed in in the marijuanas. For sure, for sure. So, uh, if you haven't ordered anything for Valentine's Day, hey, 
go to herbal aspects. It might be something nice for you for your companion. You know, I, right. I'll throw up a uh, I'll throw up a coupon for anybody that wants okay. to for the uh, if you put up uh, what is it O A R uh, or O W R. Mm-hmm. Type in that O W R. I'll put the coupon up this evening, and uh, that'll give you twenty five percent off your order. Oh wow, that'd be awesome! Yeah, well, Alan, take advantage next, of that, everyone. <laughs> the next time I'm at the uh, Mad Radio Studio, I'm gonna swing in. That's right next door, right? I'll have to come say hi to you. Yo, so that's really funny. So, uh, year, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was on Devil Radio, and um because of the relationship that I developed with Mike Crute, the gentleman who owns Double Radio, uh, when I opened up Herbal Aspect uh, at, at, on University, he hit me up and he was like, hey, man, they got a space next door. Maybe I should slide through. And I was like, yeah, Crutey, let's make this the dopest block on the on the scene. And there it was. So Crutey actually followed me to so that I could be a close source. It was dope. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come say hi next time I'm around. Can't wait to see you. Awesome. You're making connections. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Eric uh, for our last segment. And then, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Take it away. Yes, thank you so much. Well, what a fun Zoom from abortion rights to fair maps to gummies. to This was a very diverse set of issues, a very diverse crowd, which is exactly um, the point, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, this issue intersects with every issue in our lives and whatever priority that you have. Um, so on that note, um, I know I'm feeling inspired to get out and take action. Fun fact, one of the first elections in Wisconsin that I really got invested in uh, was the 2019 Supreme Court election where Brian Hagedorn shocked us all when he narrowly won. Uh, that feeling had me sick to my stomach for months and I uh, never wanted to wake up after election day again asking myself if I could do more. So that's why we are so glad that you've all joined us today because there is strength in numbers and when we organize, we win. So Will, can you please put our action toolkit link in the chat here on Zoom um, as well as on Facebook? You can see on the slide right here, um, that link is uh, right in the red up there too. That is bit.ly slash flip scowis, all lowercase. A uh, nice little quick link for you. Um, and when you click on that link, you will see our action toolkit, which I am going to bring up right now. And it looks like we can see that on our screen. So that's awesome. So we have four quick but really effective actions um, that we want you all to take um, in order to flip the Supreme Court and make sure that all of these issues that we've talked about today um, either become a reality or we continue to pretend the rights that we're still defending and we continue to move towards fair maps and move towards a, a fair democracy and all of those things. So first and foremost, uh, this is a nice little alliteration, SSSV. Um, first and foremost, stay connected. Um, please tell us your priorities uh, and never miss an update from our Wisconsin revolution. Uh, we are serious about holding Democrats their promises and getting bold progressive policies uh, on the agenda. So please share your priorities with us and never miss an update from the political revolution. Um, second, sign up. We are hosting a phone bank over Zoom uh, next Monday, February 20th at 6 p.m. to get out the vote. And we need your help to call voters. We're going to be calling voters in Juliana Bennett's district. So that endorsement comes back. We're going to be calling voters in her district to push her over the finish line. And again, make sure as many progressive students and young people as possible vote in the Supreme Court primary to hopefully push both Janet and Everett into the general election, which would be really wonderful to pro-democracy, pro-reproductive freedom, pro-environment, pro-equality candidates facing off the healthiest election I can imagine. Um, we'll be texting voters as well if phone calls aren't your forte, but voice-to-voice -voice conversation with the voter does go a really long way. So please sign up for that as well. Again, that's Monday, February 20th at 6 p.m. It's the day before the primary. Um, to get all kinds of young people out to vote and, and RSVPing for that will take just a couple seconds. Um, third, please share on social media. It's the third S. Um, the graphic comparing the candidates on the issues is in that link. It'll link to a little Dropbox, um, as well as a picture that you can use as your Facebook cover to share on Twitter, share on your Instagram, share wherever, anywhere and everywhere to let your loved ones and your followers and your network know um, that you support justice in Wisconsin. Um, the primary date is on that graphic. So make sure 
like Carleen said, not a lot of Wisconsinites know about this election, but uh, it is in a lot of ways the most important election in 2023. And like I said, your vote will count so much in this primary. So um, sharing this information, every single vote is going to count. That is always true. It is especially true this time. Finally, the vote. Early voting has been going on for some time. Some of you may have already cast an absentee ballot. Um, some of you may have a ballot waiting to be filled out, but whether you vote by mail, whether you vote early or you vote on election day, please do not forget to cast a ballot by 8 p.m. Um, on February 21st. Polls close at eight, so if you're in line by eight, you can vote. Um, so you have a week to cast your ballot for a progressive candidate for Supreme Court. Like Carleen said, if you have your absentee ballot with you, going to want to get that in ASAP um, because there will be no mail on Monday the 20th um, because it's President's Day. Voting is quick. So once you're done with that, you can sign up to phone bank with us as well. Um, that's it from me. So I'm actually going to put the link to this document back on screen with uh, little actions there. And I'm going to pass it back to Andre. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Yeah, thanks for doing putting that together, Eric. It was a lot of work uh, that he put into it, so definitely give him a round of applause for that. And and also uh, just give a round of applause, a virtual round of applause for the speakers, uh, Carlene, Allison, and Alan. Thank you all for joining us on Valentine's Day. You might have plans, but you made plans with us too, so we really appreciate it. But again, thank you all for joining uh, on this Valentine's Day. Uh, if you do have plans, I hope you can enjoy them and spend them with somebody you care about. But uh, again, let's continue to make continue this fight around the state of Wisconsin. And uh, like our national affiliate says, when we organize, we win. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So, all right, everyone, have a great rest of your day. And, uh, you know, let's keep working. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Allison. Hey, y'all be easy. Thanks, Alan. You as well. You as well, Alan. Thank you so much.